All right, guys, today we're taking out the old dictionary and we're looking up the word contingency. You better get fired up. A provision for an unforeseen event of circumstance. What? So when you're purchasing a home, adding a contingency to your offer is essentially you saying, if this happens, then we'll purchase the home. And while there are an endless amount of contingencies that anybody can add to their offer, here are three that I see all the time. But before we get into the good stuff, if you want more wild real estate action, feel free to check out my Facebook business page by searching The Joe Rosen Show. Or get over to Instagram and follow me at The Joe Rosen Show. All right, let's get into that first one. A sale contingency. So a sale contingency is used when the buyer of a particular property does not want to be responsible for purchasing that property unless their current home sells. So simply put, the buyer is telling the seller, if my home sells, then I will adhere to all the terms of the agreement. But if my home does not sell, you can't hold me to it. It's up to me, I can choose to buy it, or not buy it. Now obviously this contingency adds a lot of value, a lot of protection for the buyer, but it often presents an eyesore for the seller. Because it's a big drawback for the seller, it tends to make negotiation for that buyer a lot more challenging. It's more difficult. I mean, think about it. As a seller, you don't know if that buyer's home is gonna sell in three days, three weeks, three months. Who knows? So as a buyer, if you've gotta use it, you've gotta use it. But I often recommend to my buying clients to think outside the box. Everything I'm about to say has a suck factor attached to it. But if you can take on a little short-term suck, a little short-term inconvenience, it can allow you to save thousands in negotiations and just increase that pool of available options when looking for homes. All right, so here are four quick thinking outside of the box options. All right, first, sell your home and then go look for that next home. Yeah, it's not fun. And yeah, you're probably gonna overpay for a short-term rental. But again, you've gotta ask yourself if being able to negotiate a better offer is worth it. All right, my second think outside of the box option is sell your home and then just move in with a friend or a relative. Again, we're only talking about a month or two, just until you find that next home. But taking on that little short-term inconvenience could save you thousands. All right, my third think outside of the box option it takes a little bit more negotiation power. My third idea is ask for a lease from the seller of the home that you're about to buy. Now, this too can present a pretty big eyesore for a lot of sellers, as most sellers just wanna sell it and forget about it, right? They wanna move on. But for those sellers who are concerned more about the money than they are the time and convenience, this can often be a viable solution. All right, number four is for all my big spenders out there, you can use some cash that you've got on hand or liquidate some investments you've got to purchase that second home. Once your current home sells, take the proceeds from that sale to replenish those investments. Yeah, again, there are drawbacks to all of these options, but don't forget that you are gaining negotiation power and you're also opening up the door to more home options. All right, our second big contingency is the inspection contingency. So on most home transactions, you're gonna see that the buyer hires a third-party inspection company. Once the inspection's complete and the buyer receives a list of all the issues with the home, the buyer may choose to negotiate any replacements or repairs they'd like. They can also ask for a price reduction or a credit to cover the costs of the negotiated repairs instead of having the actual repairs done. Now don't forget, the seller also has the option of negotiating, right? This means that both parties have to come together. They have to agree on how they're gonna move forward before you can actually get to the next step. But the buyer has a great deal of leverage during this time. They can literally walk for any reason they want. There's a broken $2 cabinet handle, the tiniest hairline crack in a shower tile, or a light bulb's out. As small as those concerns may seem, the buyer can choose to walk at any time during that inspection contingency period. So that begs the question, what usually happens, Joe? Because every home comes with their issues, most buyers are gonna overlook the minor concerns and really hone in on and focus on those major issues. So major issues usually include roof leaks, maybe a malfunctioning air conditioner or water heater, or the dreaded presence of major mold. Now, most buyers and sellers wanna continue moving forward 
without impacting the closing date. So what I tend to see is buyers overlooking the small stuff and asking the seller for a credit to cover the major stuff. By asking for a credit, nobody's responsible for taking care of any repairs or replacements, so it's easy to move forward towards that closing date. Again, this is all negotiable, but that's what I tend to see in most cases. All right, let's get to that third one, and it is the financing contingency. So a financing contingency simply states that if the buyer can secure the financing that they notated in the purchase agreement, they promise to purchase the home. But if that particular financing falls through, the buyer is not required to purchase that property. Now, that doesn't mean the buyer can't purchase the property. It simply states they don't have to. So when have I seen this happen? Let me give you a couple tantalizing examples. Once a buyer is approved by a lender, if that buyer makes a large enough purchase on credit, it may impact their debt to income ratios enough to change the terms of that loan or cause that funding option to fall apart altogether. Ah, one of my least favorite examples is if that buyer loses their job. Oh, now that's obviously going to impact the buyer's income, right? And in that case, the loan almost always falls through. Here's another one. If after getting approved, the buyer misses a payment to a creditor, it could negatively impact your credit report, causing the loan to come into question and can often be the nail in the coffin. Because of this, it's always a good rule of thumb that from the time you get pre-approved as a buyer until the time you actually close on the house, be as financially boring as you possibly can. This gives you the best shot of keeping all of those loan requirements intact and successfully closing on that next great home. All right, if you're watching this on YouTube and you found this information valuable, I'd really appreciate it if you get down there and hit that subscribe button. And if you're watching this bad boy on Facebook, I'd love it if you get down there and hit that like button. If you guys have any questions or there's anything I can ever help you with, please feel free to email me at findafloridahouse at gmail.com. All right, as always, thank you so much for joining me and you guys stay fired up.